<laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, um, and welcome to our third session of our Amakitia Clarinet Extravaganza Weekend. Yes. Well, when we were considering, considering the guest panels for this session, we immediately thought of some of our favorite clarinetists who currently share their pedagogical knowledge in numerous ways on social media, and we'd like to introduce them to you before we begin this session. Michelle Anderson is a professional clarinetist from Vancouver, BC, who teaches at the University of British Columbia. She's also founder of the wonderful Clarinet Mentors, www.clarinetmentors.com, which provides online live and recorded clarinet trainings to people worldwide. Brad Bain owns and operates Epic-CNC and Bain LLC, the factory and outlet for all Bain mouthpieces, reeds, barrels, and bells. Brad's products can be found at www.clarinetmouthpiece.com and www.epic slash, sorry, dash cnc.com. And his social media featuring clarinet related videos can be found on Facebook and coming soon on YouTube. Brad is also principal clarinet of the Oklahoma City Philharmonic Orchestra and enjoys life with his wife, Solri, and three cats, Remy, Dory, and Ellie. And then finally, Wesley Ferreira is Associate Professor of Clarinet at Colorado State University and Performing Artist with Van Doren and Selmer Paris. He is Artistic Director and Faculty of the Summer Lift Clarinet Academy Program and Creator of the Air Revelation Breath Support Training Program for Musicians. And again, you know, we picked these three wonderful artists because they each have their own little niche in in the sharing of clarinet um, ideas. Again, Michelle with her wonderful uh, clarinet mentors that you can find on YouTube, those videos. Brad has been doing amazing videos on his own Facebook page um, about reads and mouthpiece work. It's just awesome. And then Wesley, I think, I think Wesley's, I think it, tip number 89 he does a tip tuesdays on facebook um so you have to make sure to check those out so anyway we're so thrilled to have you all here and they're each gonna share three tips three of their favorite tips and we're gonna kind of go a little bit um in a uh a, a, a semblance of order and our first tip we're gonna have michelle anderson share her first tip with us now great thank you diane so this is just a fun little thing that you can use either in your own playing or your teaching. And I, I pre-recorded because I'm in a hotel and I wasn't sure what the internet is. So we'll play my video at this point. I'm going to share with you a really useful diagnostic tool for clarinet playing. I call it the embouchure tester. It's an unstable fingering that should sound like the high G sharp that we find at the top of the staff. Because it's unstable, the way that it doesn't work gives us clues to what we may be doing wrong in our playing. Here's the fingering, thumb register key. First two fingers on the left hand, we leave the third hole open. First two fingers on the right hand. Here's what it'll sound like if things are going well. Sounds like a G sharp. This note will squeak incredibly easily if there's any biting going on. So very commonly, we'll squeak. That's a clue that we just need to open our jaw a little bit, round our corners in. The second thing this note does very commonly is uh, won't speak and we get that undertone. Often they'll go hand in hand. We get the undertone, we're frustrated because it doesn't work, so we bear down and bite and then we squeak. <laughs> what we want is somewhere in between. So when we get the jaw loose enough that we're not biting and the air fast enough, we get the G sharp. For more advanced technique using this fingering, if you can take this note and play it as soft as humanly possible, any other note, any extreme altissimo, you name it, is going to feel easy to play. Try it out. It's a really good warm-up tool and a diagnostic tool. So that's just a short little thing. I, I use that in master classes with people. I use it with my own students. Um, if I am in a hurry to warm up, I'll pull out that fingering and just play it as softly as I can. And I feel like it really gets my air going. So that's a quick pointer for you. Okay. So Brad. Sorry, Brad, I met you. <laughs> I didn't mute myself. Sorry, go ahead, Denise. 
I was just going to say Brad. <laughs> I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me, Denise? Thank you. So sorry. Um, <laughs> this no this Zoom thing, I'm still a bit of a novice. Um, Michelle, your your the fake fingering exercise is such a great way to explore all aspects of the clarinet playing experience: the wind, the embouchure, the you got to have the right read, the matrix. Um, so uh, my tip is uh, one of the the. It's not my personal tip. It comes from my teacher, uh, Mr. Marcellus, who um, I know. Um, Diane is also a student of, and maybe she remembers the same lesson, but it was certainly um, a profound moment for me when he said something so simple and so profound as every note needs to, to be either coming from someplace in the music or going to someplace in the music. Um, you need to map out your music. I, as a teacher, must be able to ask you, stop you in the moment, you're, any moment in, in your clarinet playing, and ask, what are you doing? And why on that note, that G sharp in question. And, you know, until that, that point, yeah, I was sort of walking around in a bit of a fog. You know, I had all these great ideas. Lessons were, were coming and going so quick, and I was trying to process it all. But it was such a simple and such a poignant bit of advice. You're crescendoing to some place in the music, perhaps the appoggiatura, a wonderful moment. All roads lead to the appoggiatura. I mean, Rome? No, the appoggiatura. <laughs> the most important gravitational influence of any kind of harmonic element in music, I dare say. Of course, the appoggiatura is not something that is used in all styles. We don't see the appoggiatura frequently in the music of Stravinsky, for example. His musical language is much more rhythmically derived. And his, his language can be um, derived from accents. Is it a hard accent or is it a somber moment? There's so many different elements from so many different styles and different eras in the music, uh, musical language that we explore. But if we can figure out the basic, uh, the root of the exploration, for example, in that same lesson my teacher Marcellus mentioned, there are four basic phrases. Music comes from melody, from rhythm, from harmony, and from the appoggiatura. And you heard me, I added um, articulation as, an, as another element. But those four basic phrases um, can help you go far as you explore um, the enigma that sometimes is before you on that two-dimensional surface that is the music. Our jobs as musicians are to extract the two-dimensional world that we see before us and convert it into the three, four-dimensional reality of the soundscape of our stage. So that, that is my little nugget of in, uh, tip, my nugget of information. Know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Awesome. Wesley. All right. So my tips, all three of my tips today have to do with um, breaking down the tension points that we all grow up playing with. And, and so we already heard Michelle talking about, you know, that, that embouchure tester. And, and if you're not able to play that note correctly, then there's some, maybe a little bit of tension in the embouchure. You know, we all start playing the clarinet when we're younger and we do our best to make it work and we get encouragement from our teachers and maybe our band directors but there's always these kind of like physical limitations that we develop and as teachers i think everyone here on the panel will will agree that we're always trying to help the student break these down so you'll see that a lot of my tips have to do with um, um, breaking down these tension points so my tip is is this if you struggle to slur across the break between the throat tones and the low clarion register without creating a slight break in the sound, then you'll practice practice playing down the 12th. I'm gonna demonstrate what that is, playing down the 12th. So um, here's, uh, let's see if you can all see that there. I'm gonna play, uh, no, you can't see that, that's okay. Um, 
I'm going to play it first. You'll hear that I'm going from the A over the break to a C natural. And on purpose, I'm going to kind of constrict my throat. And this is something that we'll, I'll often hear students do, just a little bit of a constriction of the throat. Then you'll actually hear a break over that break. All right, and so you heard that break over the break. So what we'll do is I will ask the student to finger exactly what you see, but don't press the register key. So what will happen is the notes that are going to the clarion register will actually sound down a twelfth. So I'm going to play again that same passage. This time I'm not going to press the register key. I'm going to allow those clarion register notes to sound down the twelfth. So I'm playing exactly what I see, but every note that's in the clarion register, I allow to just sound down because I'm not pressing the register key, okay? And then we do this several times to really get comfortable psychologically thinking that these clarion register notes are gonna sound down. So let me do this a few more times. And so I'll tell the students, really feel it going down. And then what I'll say is this. Now do it one more time. This time, have your thumb kind of act like an independent person who will kind of trick you and just press the register key while you're expecting it to go down. So you'll expect to hear do, 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 do. Just expect that in every part of your body, feel that. So sometimes I'll even tell them, you know, feel like you can scrunch your eyebrows to feel it going down. So I'll do it now, thinking and feeling down the 12th, but my thumb is gonna surprise me and press the register key where the clarion register notes should sound. Okay, so now we hear that clearly went smoothly over the register and um, it, it really is that simple. So when we're thinking of playing down the 12th, we relax our throat because our brains know we're going down to a low note. So we relax. And then we let the clarinet do its job. We let the register key do its job because we're feeling and thinking down. The issue with playing over the break is that we, um, I think, are accustomed to getting tense because, you know, when we're first starting to play over the break, you know, any sound we make over the break, people are generally uh, really enthusiastic, right? Your teacher might be like, great, you got the notes. You know, you, you know, you're just lucky that you got all the fingerings and covering all the tone holes. And so people are generally enthusiastic about you making any tone over the break, but generally it comes with that, you know? And um, so how do we, how do we learn to play over the break without having that tension? It's to think and to feel down the 12th so that you psychologically, you're not thinking I need to go up and, and go tense. So that's my tip. I love that, Wesley. I know Sabine Meyer says, think downstairs to play upstairs. It's that concept. I love that. That's fantastic. So Brad, can you start us off with tip number two? Certainly. Um, okay, so this is something that we're, we're often involved in in our lives now as, as we're doing Zoom lessons and, and communications on our phones and everything. And um, the great thing about the phone is that with your phone is undoubtedly a recording app, whether it be one which is visible or simply where you can, it's audio only. But um, back when I was in college, I remember um, a, a, somebody a few years older than me had just won a job in the uh, Colorado Symphony, or maybe it was the Denver Symphony in the early, in, back then at the time. And I remember I asked him, to what do you attribute your recent success? He had been in finals and a variety of orchestra auditions, and he got that job, and I was so impressed. And he said, you know, I was getting close for a number of auditions, and when I started recording myself, something turned for me. I started winning. I started, I started really um, increasing my game because 
you know, when you're practicing, you're hearing yourself from one side of the instrument. You're feeling things. You're you're overloaded with with all of the um, senses of playing. You can feel the reed buzzing in your brain. You can hear the sound from the fingertips and, and so on and so forth. Not to mention all the trials and struggles of just navigating connections, crossing the break and so forth. Um, that when you he record yourself, you simply play through the excerpt or the challenging thing that you're practicing and then go back immediately and listen. And then you'll hear something. Undoubtedly, you could be the greatest clarinet player in the world and you'll still hear something that you want to strive to improve. And so the, the point of my tip is record yourself, listen to yourself immediately and go back and repair it immediately. I remember um, I had a student, she did a, a, a recital and, um, and I said, Heidi, I know that you played beautifully, but you probably have all of this stuff stirring around in your mind and you want to go ahead and, you know, just put it away and listen to it. Wait six weeks, wait two months and everything will feel fine and fresh and you can listen to yourself and you'll feel good. Well, that's fine for emotions to feel good, but to get better on the clarinet, we got to get right on it. You get on that, you fall off the horse, you get on the saddle and you start riding again. Apparently, I'm not a equestrian. So um, horses scare me. So anyway, um, it's so important. The simple practice tip, record yourself, listen, and get uh, get to the, the craft of improving what, what you can. Um, and just keep doing it. I now, if I have a big thing that I'm, I'm working on, I spend half my time recording myself and, and listening back and, and then with the instrument in my mouth going and practicing. So it's half time pra uh, performing, half time um, listening. And I found that I'm getting three or four times the value of the experience. I'm tripling or quadrupling my effect efficacy as a clarinet player. This is, I think, the best advice I, was, I received as a student and it's the best advice I can give to you. Yeah, you know, I, I'd like to jump in there and just second Brad's uh, tip there. You know, I think of all the tips you might, tips or pieces of advice you might hear, uh, that's that recording yourself and listening has got to be in the top five. It just has to be in the top five because it's so crucial. Sometimes I think the best tips are the ones that are the easiest. They're the ones that are the duh, of course. But uh, they tend to also be the ones that people don't do. I wonder if it's because it's so simple that you kind of over, people overlook it. I'd like to add a little bit uh, to Brad's as well that um, sometimes I find my students are reluctant to record themselves and maybe there's people out there watching now that feel this way because they don't like the way they sound, right? They have an aversion to hearing the way they sound. And so it, we know that recording and listening back is a necessity. So I'll tell my students a couple things. One is to record in the best place you can. You know, even if that means you're going to record in the hallway or the stairwell late at night somewhere where you're, you know, enjoying, you know, maybe you're playing in a bathroom because it has the best uh, resonance. Um, do that because whatever you need to do to feel good about your sound, we can make that happen. The other thing is you might experiment with the positioning of your uh, microphone. You know, in, in the case, I, I often, when I record myself, it's just on my phone. So you can position your phone closer or further to see where you like your sound best. And then also, and this is, uh, uh, Diane, I want to thank you for that shout out of my tip Tuesday. I've been, I've been putting tip Tuesdays since 2016 now on Facebook every Tuesday. Um, and you're right, I'm up to 80, 89, I think. But I had a tip uh, long ago that said, after you've recorded yourself, listen on different devices. So if I'm ever testing, say, a mouthpiece or reads or something else, or, or maybe I'm not happy with the way I sound. What I'll do is make sure to listen on different devices. So I've noted that if I listen to my Apple earbuds, or if I listen to my Bose headset, or if I listen to this Bluetooth speaker, or if I listen to that Bluetooth speaker, if I listen to this car in this car, if I listen in that car, if I listen to this stereo, I, I sound completely different. So sometimes if I'm testing out a, a piece of equipment, I will listen 
to this mouthpiece, say for example, on different devices, and then I will judge. I like mouthpiece one on Bluetooth speaker one, Bluetooth speaker two, headset one. Uh, I like mouthpiece two on car, uh, and it'll be different. And so I think record yourself in, the, in whatever way sounds best to you and, and listen to different devices and don't necessarily, um, you know, reject your sound because you're, you're not happy with it. Because I spent the beginning part of the quarantine, uh, as we all had a little more time, just going back to recording myself all the time. And it made an incredible difference. Like I just felt like I've improved so much even at this point over the last four months. And it really was because of recording and listening and recording and listening. So it's never too late to start. That's the other thing. Well, and I think because of this pandemic that we're in, many of our students are having to do video recordings for their lessons. And, you know, I as a teacher, I am listening to those videos with them in our Zoom lessons. And it has taught them, I think, so much more because they are being forced to really listen. And so I think these points are awesome that that you guys are sharing. Great. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, I want to jump in when when I saw that Brad wanted to talk about recording. I was really excited because I completely agree with Brad and Wesley that this is one of the most important things we can do to get information that will help us improve our playing. And so I wanted to kind of tag team on that in two ways. First of all, I love what Wesley just said about sometimes we don't like recording ourselves, so we avoid it. And I think as musicians, we can be really self-critical. We can record something and listen. And there might be all kinds of good stuff, but typically what I will sometimes do, I'll be like, oh, I didn't know that note was out of tune. And oh, how could I, I didn't know I was tonguing that, you know, and I have this whole list of things I don't like. So that makes the recording experience seem really unpleasant. And so what I often will encourage my students to do is just record a very short segment. You know, it's so easy with our modern computers and phones to do this, maybe two measures and listen, and you might have a few things you don't like, but pick one thing to improve, fix it, re-record it till you like that, and then keep improving it. And eventually you'll get a recording that you really like. And, and I agree with Brad, we have to fix it right away. Otherwise, if we're just playing music we love, but with the same habits that we weren't aware of, we're making our mistakes really well rehearsed and they become really ingrained. Um, but in, in this time of COVID, I've been doing a lot of online master classes and having people send me recordings that we review at lessons. And it's also made me aware of some other things, other things we can do in our videos, most importantly to listen, as we all just talked about. But I shot another video that Jessica will share that I've been using with students on things we can look for, the visual clues. And it's related to what uh, Wesley was saying earlier about not having tension that gets in the way of our playing. But um, if you could just play that, Jessica, in case my internet goes funny here, that would be great. I like to have a visual checklist of things to look for when I'm looking back at a recording that I've made by myself. And there's just a few areas I encourage you to notice as you're watching your video. One is we're just going to take a quick check of embouchure. We all know what the basics are, but we want to make sure as we're looking at ourselves, first of all, that we see our corners coming in around. Sometimes, if we're really concentrating, we fall into a kind of biting mode, and then we'll, we'll see an action there. A great way to film ourselves on clarinet is in profile, so we can see what we're doing here. Obviously, if I move my chin and lip around, I lose tone quality, so you want to look for that good um, pointed chin and your bottom lip away from your ring. The next area that a lot of us don't take the time to watch for is where we have unnecessary tension in our body. Sometimes shows up in our jaw, we'll hear that if we're squeaking or sounding pinched, but a lot of times we hold tension in our shoulders and sometimes it's only at the hardest spot of the music. We're playing along, it sounds great, we hit the hard bit. Ugh. So I watch my shoulders, you know if I see this I'm in trouble. I also watch my fingers. Maybe they're really relaxed much of the time. And I hit that hard bit and they start going smack, 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 smack. So I'm watching for the tension there. And while we're on the subject of fingers, that's another thing I look at. Are they moving a lot? 
again, we tend to do that more in hard bits. We want to train them to stay really close to the keys. So I would just watch, are my fingers staying close? So I started to let them fly a bit. And if I notice that, then I can make that something that I work on and practice. The other thing I'll look at is, you know, aside from tension here and there, is just how is my hand shape generally. We want a relatively straight line from elbow to wrist to hand, and that goes along with our relaxation. So these are just quick visual things we look for related to embouchure, unnecessary tension in shoulders and upper body, relaxed arms, and our fingers staying arched and close to the keys. So I think that having a, a visual checklist like that has just been one more element that has come out of more online lessons for me that I find really helpful, and I encourage my students to have that visual checklist when they're reviewing their own videos. Awesome. Wesley. <laughs> All right, my next tip is, is this one. Determine at what dynamic level you play with your best tone. Expand from there. Concentrate, listen, and aim for that same quality of tone and feeling in your body when playing at louder and softer dynamics. You know, so playing the clarinet with good tone uh, you probably have heard from your teachers, requires a few things, right? We want to stay relaxed and not tense, as Michelle was just talking about. We want to have a good embouchure. We want to have the inside of our mouth, there are oral cavity in the right position. And that's, you know, for the type of tone that as classical clarinetists we are aiming for. We want to have the middle of our tongue arched up. And so typically, uh, if we're studying music, we're doing this well from time to time. And it's, it's typical that it, uh, there's a dynamic level that you play at your best. For some of you, it might be a mezzo piano. For some of you, it might be a piano. For some of you, it might be a forte, like really using the proper amount of air to make that sound. So play, you know, most of us will start with long tones maybe or play scales and, or even do kind of a little noodle and we, you know, feel like we sound our best. Find the dynamic level where you sound your best play it as a long tone, and then work to expand that. So um, if it's mezzo piano, then you want to play, say, several long tones at mezzo piano. Listen to the quality of the tone, okay? Listen to that focus, listen to that uh, resonance, listen to the focus, and then try to play with a little bit louder dynamic, still maintaining that same quality of sound. As important is also to feel your body because often when we're tense, we don't have the same good quality of tone. And so if your mezzo piano is your great dynamic volume, as you're playing a little louder and listening to the tone, also feel that you're not changing. Your embouchure is not changing. The inside your tongue position isn't changing. Your throat isn't clenching. Uh, and the same goes for playing at a softer dynamic. So it's really those two things that we have to always be thinking about. Using our ears, right, uh, to listen to good quality of tone, but also then, you know, using our minds to feel, become mindful of how our body is or is not changing. So, you know, find that great quality of tone and then work to expand. Awesome. So before we go on to our third and final set of tips, do our panelists have anything else you want to add to this second round of tips? I have something. Um, I remember Wesley mentioned, um, you know, sometimes students do, are, are working on, on something and they just, you know, with the, with the recording, they just don't like the way they sound. And you know, to ex he mentioned exploring, you know, various speakers, various microphones and, and all the rest. And I think that's really important in this day and age, we really should all have some personal skill set. I mean, this is, we call it microphone technique, recording technique. Have you heard of something called the proximity effect? Um, they used it a lot. You know, think Nat King Cole on the Christmas album. He gets right up onto the microphone and he gets this big, round, fat body of sound. And these are techniques. We should learn how to use our recording apparatus. But also, I think extremely important, we need to learn to love the clarinet. Love yourself. By that I mean, if you don't like the way you sound, you're going to be in for a really hard go of it. The journey will be pure hell. We need to love our sounds. Now, by that I mean we need to propagate well. We need to produce the best version of our sounds possible. But if, if, that, if what is re resultant of your best effort is something you dislike, 
then maybe you need to check in with your, with your idea of what a good sound should be. It's very simple. If you're getting good, efficient vibrations, you are intrinsically sounding like a clarinet. And if you don't like that, I question whether you like the clarinet. And I question whether you should be doing this. And I say that with a certain curt assertiveness because there are too many of us that are torn up inside because we are striving for something that is not the instrument, that is not the clarinet, that is not what, um, where, where we should be. We end up working too, and, and the point is, we end up working too hard to sound something that is not the clarinet. For example, I think a lot of clarinetists would rather sound like a Con 8D. For those of you that don't know what a Con 8D is, that is a horn. Old fashioned term, a French horn. Others want to sound like an alto saxophone. Why not sound like an oboe? Why not sound like something in between, the clarinet? I, I'm not questioning your concept I'm, unless you're torn up inside. And if, and if the truth is that you're getting efficient vibrations and you don't like it, maybe your sound is good and you just need to tweak your, your concept a little bit. Concept is king. That's the most important thing for, for anything. But, you know, people ask me as a mouthpiece maker, you know, should I try it with this read or that read? Well, first let's make sure that your concept is, is, is there in check. Then let's get a good read. Then let's get a good mouthpiece. Then let's get a good barrel bell instrument. Then let's get a good read, a good ligature in that order. You notice the mouthpiece salesman is telling you that first and foremost, you need a good read. And, and above that, you need a good concept. Thanks. I think we could talk about developing a concept of sound for the next 24 hours, right? So maybe if there's time at the end of the last set of clarinet tips, we can maybe delve into that a little bit. So put your thinking caps on. But Wesley, we'll have you start the last round of clarinet tips. All right. So my, my last tip is this. Sing through your horn musically, but do not sing through it physically. And so we probably have heard that term. You want to sing, like sing through the line, sing through it. But it's really important when we're talking about singing through the clarinet, we're talking about uh, an expression. We're talking about expression, musicality. But sometimes I think if we're not clear, and I'm, so I'm very clear now as a teacher, do not sing physically. And so this is what happens. And you're all out there. Go ahead and, and experiment with this. Just sing a high note and then go to a low note. So we'll go like, oh, oh. And when you do that, notice what your tongue does. Go ahead. Try that again. Oh, oh. okay. And if you noticed me, my tongue dropped. I was like, oh, oh. also my jaw, my jaw lowered. And so let me just kind of make up a line and I'm going to go really high, like da, 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 da. So what do I do at the top? I can feel my throat constricting up there. I hear, oh, you know, I can feel it's a little bit tight. And so what we get caught up doing as clarinet players is singing physically. And so we're making all of these changes with our embouchure and changing our, our tongue arch position in our mouth. And often also with our throat kind of constricting and moving, just like we do when we're, we're singing. So as I'm speaking to you right now, I can feel my jaw moving. I can feel my tongue moving around in my mouth. I can feel changes in my throat as maybe I'm a little bit raspy. And then now I'm a little bit clearer. I can, as humans, we are, uh, because we speak, we're really great at making all these changes here. But as clarinet players, we do not want to be making those many changes anywhere with our embouchure, with our tongue arch position in our mouth, and also with our throat, okay? We wanna keep our throats relaxed. We wanna have our embouchure set. We wanna have the middle of our tongue, right? Arched E in our mouth. And then we have to be able to isolate that, right? Okay, so we're articulating on the reed. You notice that the front of the tongue is going up and down, touching the mouthpiece, the reed, but that the middle stays. There's three parts of the tongue, the front, the middle, and then the back, which makes subtle changes for, you know, voicing and changing of notes in different registers. But these are, these are very just subtle, subtle changes. The best thing that you could uh, uh, maybe think about is to play in one position or to play every note will feel similar with respect to your embouchure, throat, and tongue arch. 
then what makes the musicality? What makes the expression? The, the, it's all with our air, right? It's all with our air making these, uh, primarily with our air, making these, uh, you know, changes, sometimes many changes to show expression, to show singing through our instrument. So remember, we want to sing musically, yes, but we don't want to sing technically with our bodies, physically. It's a great point. It's a great point because I say that so often, sing through the clarinet. I'm going to think twice about how I say that now. I like that. Yeah, I think uh, sometimes I think as teachers, like we'd probably all attest up here that, uh, you know, as we're explaining things, uh, so it's how it's interpreted sometimes is, is, uh, is uh, interesting. Yes. Don't assume, right? <laughs> Good. Anybody else want to add to that? I, I want to add to that, actually. I love this idea of, you know, how when, we're, when we sing, our body naturally changes. And I'm very aware when we play clarinet that our brain gets conditioned for example, when we say, when my lips make this shape, you know, oh, my, my tongue wants to say, oh, and if on clarinet, we want our tongue higher, our, it's just habit that when my lips move this way, my tongue's going to move here. So I always look for creative ways to help retrain our brain and break those habits. And so one is I'll have my students make an embouchure shape, you know, and it may be an exaggerated, almost like a chimpanzee shape, but then try and say, he, 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 he. So to say he, well, our lips are saying, oh, and that, that helps shake up our brain. And there's so many, I call it a brain disruptor, things we can look for to help us. We're so used to when we say T, 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 when we speak, our jaw moves. And so our, we get used to our jaw and tongue must move at the same time, or our breath must accent everything. And those translate as bad habits on the clarinet. So I encourage people just to look for ways to break that habit. Sometimes putting a finger on your lips and just pretending like you're tonguing, but making sure there's no movement helps our brain to shake up those patterns that we've developed along the way. So always be looking for habits that come from speaking or something else that don't serve us on clarinet. Can I add something? Thank you, Michelle. Yes. Um, I I, a couple of months ago participated in an online academy, the clarinet academy, Ixi Chin's um, lessons online, and one of her guests was um, Diana Haskell. And for those of you who don't know, she is a force of nature slash clarinetist in the St. Louis Symphony, and she just has so much to offer. And I was, you know, I thought, I, hey, Diana is in the room. I want to hear what she has to say. So I was listening to her master class, her, her lessons, and somebody was playing, um, and she said, you know, you're moving a lot. And I love it. It looks so beautiful. But the thing is, when you're on a committee, I'm on a committee for the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. Now, I, you know, I'm a clarinet player. I'm forgiving. But the flute player, the horn player, the conductor, they can hear your movement. And that bothers them. I've witnessed that. So, and so it got me thinking twice, not only about, you know, these physical manifestations of how we talk and how we sing and does that distort the the technical process of playing the clarinet, but does it distort the sound as well? And so doing this video thing, I was doing a little thing, preparation for a Facebook video, and um, I was talking about moving and how this was an inspiration to me. And, and I played a, a very tricky to navigate high floating interval from the very beginning, the main theme, in fact, from um, Bruckner's Seventh Symphony and just the, getting the intonation right and the, 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 the notes to speak and to, to float and everything. And, and, I, and I played it and I said, I'll show you when I move, you can hear it. And so I did this thing where I was moving and I just played it beautifully. I couldn't believe it. It was in completely incongruent with the point I was trying to make. So <laughs> now I'm confused. I think ultimately in everything we do, there's probably a middle ground, right? There, you know, okay, allow there to be a certain freeness and connection with the spirit of the music. And if there's a little bit of movement, let it come. But don't do it in so such a way that the little old lady with blue hair out in the audience says, what's that? The clarinet players sound distorting? <laughs> That's my point. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, let's go on to Michelle's last tip here. 
All right. Yeah, I feel like I have to put myself on report because I tend to move when I play too. This is <laughs> what it is. Um, this is actually much more specific and it's especially helpful for people who are just beginning to explore what should we do inside our mouth, you know, which we sometimes call voicing to get the best classical clarinet sound. So um, this one would be handy to see the video because it's a tool that we can teach or do with a tuner in hand and the video has both together. Here's an exercise to really help check to see if your voicing, which is the shape of your mouth, how you hold your tongue inside your mouth, is on the right track. And again, this works right with students as well. We know that to make a good sound, generally if we're aiming for a classical sound, we want our tongue fairly high. And different people have different ways of teaching it. Some people describe a hue sound. I like to have my students try and say he, which raises their tongue, whatever system works. Here's a tangible tool to help us. What we're gonna do is take a tuner and we're simply gonna play starting on our high G with our left hand register key and slurring up to high C with the tuner in front of us. And here is what I find. If our tongue is generally in a good position for a nice classical tone, the tuner will usually remain fairly steady. Most people who are not yet very experienced with the right classical voicing will go flatter as it goes higher. And so I'm not even so much worried if their first note is right in tune, it's just if we see it get progressively flat, that's a clue the tongue might not be in the right place. So let me demonstrate that. I'm gonna have my tongue kind of low. I'm not gonna make it really, really bad, but let's watch what happens to the tuner when that's the case. You could see by looking at the how many cents flat I was, it just kept getting more and more flat. And it wasn't an awful tongue position, but enough that it made it a little bit, at least in this room, a little harsh sounding. What happens when I actually take that and have my tongue a little higher, we're gonna see the pitch being much more stable. This is just me raising my tongue, thinking of that he position. a tiny bit sharp but I was pretty consistently sharp so that's a good indication that what I'm doing inside is working really well the reason I love this is if people are trying to play the high C and it shows us flat what they naturally do to bring the pitch up often does involve them putting the tongue in the right place so it's just a useful tool to help us get the concept of voicing really easily so um, what I did the second time is I put my tongue more into the position that I've trained my tongue to do. And what we saw is that the tuner stayed virtually in exactly the same place as I, as I slurred up to it. And uh, it's just a really tangible way for someone to see if they're in the right place. And one of the reasons I love this as a tool is I know for me, when my teacher first started talking about voicing and tongue position, it was so abstract. And I, I just didn't know what I should do with it, but if I could watch the tuner and make it in tune, usually the things I'm changing are related to tongue position. So it helps me get the feel for it. And then as a bonus, if I pay attention to how I sound, you know, once I have that high C more in tune, I probably have better voicing, the tone improves. And that started to help teach me what a good classical sound sounds like right there in that room. And so that relates to our concept of how do we get our concept of good tone. And this is a tool to help us do that. Yeah, so Tonal Energy is the app. And I think it's on both iOS and Android. It's a, a really fun app to have. Great, and I think that covers that tip. Tonal Energy, great. Well, I'll um, mention my tip about reads. Um, but before we do it, it comes from an inspiration that I had now that I'm spending time online do, exploring clarinet in, in new ways I never imagined. I found myself looking at Michael Rusnik's, um, he's the principal clarinet in the Pittsburgh Symphony, old tutorial on double tonguing. It's probably six or eight years old. It's kind of grainy. Uh, pixelated. Um, he's buttoned down in a nice jacket and he's just talking so beautifully, such clean words. There isn't a word that is out of place 
it's scripted, but probably naturally flowing words. Is the, is, I'm just inspired by his presentation, among many other things. So he is talking he, for Diodario on be, behalf of Diodario about uh, double tonguing. And he gives this wonderful tutorial about uh, double tonguing or multiple tonguing. I don't know. I can't remember what he was calling about, uh, talking about it. We should all check it out if we have interest in, in multiple tonguing. Um, and then at the very end, he said, and remember, f throw away reads often. And I thought, that's interesting. He's, you know, he's, he's sort of presenting on behalf of Diodario. Well, that kind of makes sense. He's, you know, work through reads a lot. That's in the, in the read company's behalf. But that's not what he meant, is it? What I think he meant was that we can only play one read at a time. And chances are we've got multiple cases of reads. And probably only two or three of these reads are really performance worthy and the other ones not so. So rather than just keep those bad reads in my case and risk putting myself out there on a bad read, presenting myself poorly and fighting the instrument, throw them away, get rid of them and find good replacements. So my point comes from that framing, from that foundation of thought. I said, um, the value of a good read cannot be underestimated. Curate a list of excerpts to be played daily as a check for your read's full range of performance, and then throw away the bad reads. So what do I mean by curating a list? It doesn't have to take long, by the way. I, in the morning, first thing that I do is I go through my read case, objective, throw away at least one read. And I play through five or ten minutes worth of excerpts that I find vital to my needs at the moment. I mentioned that Bruckner 7. That was, for me, I, that symphony required a read that could do it. So my entire objective as a clarinet player that week was, can I find a way to get those high notes to speak really soft and in tune, right on point. Other times we're playing the Nutcracker. When I go to the third page, there's three quarters of a page of music that I want to be able to play on one breath. Another one breather, Brahms three, the A clarinet solo. I don't need to play it on one breath, but truly there is no good place to take a breath. So I want to know that I can. If I can, that speaks to me, that litmus test speaks to me. It tells me that my read is vibrating with efficiency and with efficiency begets longevity, a long phrase. So being able to play with, um, with clarity is efficiency and that gets long phrase and that's the beginning of my search. The next thing that for me those, those little litmus tests might be, can I do um, octave A's on the clarinet from Brahms third, second movement? And can I do it with a homogenous quality of sound and an impeccable intonation? That comes from density, tonal density that comes from cane density. I'm talking about reeds in ways that maybe we hadn't really considered. A lot of times you just go and you pick the reed that sounds good. I'm picking the read that feels good, that enables my artistry to blossom unencumbered. And again, if those things just as defined, the, the, the Brahms 3, the Bruckner 7, the Nutcracker Suite, another one is the overture of the Nutcracker. Da -da -dia, da -da -dia, da -da -dia. Can I play that pianissimo with clarity, with ease of response? If I can do those, the other, here's one, the Mozart clarinet concerto, measure two. Can I go A, G, uh, with a beautiful quality of articulation. It's not staccato, it's not legato, legato. It's something that is buoyant. Articulation is, by the way, not tonguing. Tonguing is what we clarinetists do to to create the musical entity that is articulation. I don't like to use with my wor my students words like legat legato or staccato. I like to use words like smooth and, and connected and atmospheric or percussive and angular and angry 
or you know whatever emotional words you want to to select for your articulation purpose and by the way there are infinite shades of articulation not just three long short and that that other one that doesn't have a dot or a line on it and those all come from how we treat our tongue i think tongue lightness is crucial we must decouple air pressure from tongue pressure but back to the read thing. So I have half a dozen or so uh, excerpts. I haven't talked about playing loud. I need to be able to blow through the read. The B flat clarinet arpeggios from Rimsky Korsakov's Capriccio Espanol. Um, if I can play those with, with ease of blowing through, I know my read has sufficient substance to be able to manage it. Can I play the high part of Galanta dances Deem, ba, 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 the, to the high E flat in tune with vigor and not uh, blowing out spread and out and out of tune. Um, and again the Brahms three solo is the is the test for soft. So you know can can I have full range? Loud, soft, articulate, smooth, um, and a range of, of articulations that are infinite. That ultimately comes from uh, the cane density. And it is not an average read. It is the one in 10. There's a famous story, Stanley Drucker, former principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic, a guy who likes to shoot from both hips, both in his personality and his art artistry. And I say that with the most loving spirit and best, most supportive, respected tone I can I can muster. Um, the joke is he went to Van Doren in France and and upon entry said, yes, I'd like to meet the person who puts the one good read in the box. By that, he means I want to know where I can find those Corleano concerto reads. This is not something that can just happen on, you know, a glance. Another story, Anthony Giliotti, um, three months before his performance, he used to be the principal in the Philadelphia Orchestra, three months before his performance of one of the Weber concertos, was talking to a friend of mine who was a student at the time, and after his lesson, he said, would you like to stay? I have to find a read for the concerto. And so he proceeded to go through six boxes of reeds, winnowed it down in about 30 minutes time to three. And he said, in April, one of those three reeds will probably be the reed that I play that concerto on. That's the world we live in. So having your, your list of excerpts that challenge the reed to help contain and close your perspective in a helpful and fruitful way to have a really good case of reads. You only play one at a time, so have two or three ones that you can count on as backups. That's my point. Right. Cal Opperman used to say to have one on your clarinet, one behind your read, and one in your pocket. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been awesome. We just have a few, about five minutes to wrap things up. Do our panelists have anything else you'd like to respond to? So much great information here today. Oh yeah, this has been really, really wonderful. Yeah, maybe just to piggyback on Brad's, um, I, I completely, tip, most recent tip, I completely agree. You know, life is too short to play on bad reads. <laughs> so we have to, I think as clarinet players, maybe you need to take a little more ownership over the process of playing on good reads and whether that means learning more about what makes a, for a good read or, um, as Brad was mentioning, just just refusing to play on a bad read. Like we're all trying to play our best. We're all trying to improve. And that's just not possible when we're playing with the bad reads. I, I'm wondering how many of the the viewers here um, are, are maybe reluctant. I find maybe students are reluctant to throw away reads because the reads cost money, right? Like, you know, like you're if you throw out eight reads and you only have one left, maybe you don't have enough money to buy another box of reads. So if, if you're out there, you know, go ahead and maybe say, yes, that's me on the chat, because that's something that I'm conscious of as a teacher, um, the, that balance between you need to have play on good reads and you need to throw out bad reads. But do you have enough money to, to replace those reads? <laughs> I see some people saying that's me. 
<laughs> but, but I think it's a change of mindset because for me, I really began to improve. Honestly, it, it was the recording thing. You know, um, as I started to record it in my younger days and getting great advice from people, but also is when I stopped playing on bad reads. It really was that. It's like if you're just playing on good reads, you'll sound better. You'll feel better about your playing. You'll be able to play uh, things technically, and I don't just mean technically with your fingers, but all the things that we need to do to play the clarinet, that will become easier. And so you start kind of just building this consistency. But so, you know, we know playing a musical instrument, and for those of you who are studying in, in say, college, like this is an investment, right? Like we all know that it costs, it, 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 it does cost money to be a musician. Um, <laughs> And especially if you're in school, just maybe create a budget and say, you know, if my science textbook cost me $100, then I'm going to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend $100 this semester or, you know, instead that'll be my reads. There's, you know, if you're lucky, four boxes of reads right there. That's 40 reads. You know, you can make it an entire semester on a science textbook and you'll see greater improvement. Uh, playing on better reads. So that's a, you know, that I think is another maybe top five, maybe top 10 best pieces of advice you could, you could get as a developing clarinetist. I find read craft fun. It's relaxing. You know, some people they'll knit a sweater or they'll do crochet or various things. I get up in the morning and I make a read and I work, you know, go through the, do my litmus test thing. And I, I find it, uh, I would miss it if I didn't have it in my life. It's, it's a wonderful part of the clarinet. I mean, you know, they say about oboists that, they, you know, nine-tenths of it is being a carpenter and then one-tenth is being a, a musician. Um, and I guarantee all the, the ones who are successful, they've come to terms with, with reed making. And I think they probably know, that it, know of its value and, and find some joy in it. I hope they do. We should find joy in what we do. For sure. Life's too short. Um, and we do have a half hour. I am so sorry that I said, oh, oh, we only have five minutes. So we can talk more, you guys. So um, so I just want I want you guys to feel free. I mean, we can either I mean, some people were talking. Um, I don't know if you've been seeing the chat, but about how sometimes it's difficult for students to self critique, you know, themselves, you know, because so often all they do is they hear the bad things. They don't even hear the good things that come out of their teacher's mouth because we're constantly trying to tweak. Um, so I don't know if you want to maybe talk a little bit about that and how, how you help students learn how to praise themselves as well as give themselves positive critiques. I'll jump into that one. I, I think it's really important for all of us, no matter what stage we're at, to have um, success experiences. And, we are extremely self-critical as a whole, I think musicians as a group. And again, back to, to the recording concept, I think what can help us feel better is to record something very short, pick one thing to fix, fix it, and then really acknowledge, wow, that actually sounds better. And then maybe pick something else in the same ex excerpt. Now I'm gonna fix this note and then fix it and feel better. And like anything we do in life, if we can track our successes, it builds confidence and it reminds us that we're just on a journey when we're learning clarinet and there's always people further up that journey than we are and further behind, but it gives us that sense that we're moving along the right path. So I think we need little successes and to acknowledge them. From a teaching point of view, I um, uh, vowed uh, that I would try to avoid at least saying anything from a negative context in, in a negative word like that was bad can you you know x y and z i i, I would say um okay the so-and-so was great but this section here maybe we could talk about what we could do to make it even similar to that really good moment what do you th and then and then i would frame it to the student what do you think um could have been done uh, to that same level and then let and then ex have a conversation with them and and eliminate disallow them from saying oh well this was bad you know and that was a little bit better uh, so that so that we can have a, a, both practice the art of positive 
uh, productive criticism, if, that, if that's a phrase. And it takes practice, it takes a hard, more effort, but I think in the long run, when there's a negative spirit in the room, it's like eating junk food. It's going to kill you sooner or later. Yeah, and I, you know, in my response, I responded to that, um, I think, Lisa, right, um, in terms of recording yourself. And I just mentioned that uh, it's the same thing with life. If at the end of the day, you look back and you say, how was my day today? And that's your question. Your, your brain will most often go to the things that were negative. You'll think, oh, this happened to me today. I didn't get to eat my lunch because someone was talking to me too much. Um, or all sorts of things, right? I didn't get the chance to finish this. And, but if you ask yourself the question, what were the best parts of my day? Then you'll automatically start with the positives. And that's what's important. So, you know, in recording yourself, go in knowing I'm going to listen back and I'm going to list one, two, or three of the, the really good things that I'm hearing about my playing. And then only after that point, then can you maybe more critically, um, more critically answer the things that you didn't feel were as good. And it's always about language, right? You know, it's always about communication. So sometimes it's great to listen to the recording and not think of it as yourself. Think of it as, say, your friend. So if your friend sent you that recording and said, can you give me some feedback? What are the things I need to work on? I think you'd be much less critical of the friend. You'd probably choose your words carefully, right? Because you wouldn't want to hurt your friend's feelings or insult them. And uh, that's what we need to be doing for ourselves is to, is to speak to ourselves maybe more kindly, uh, choose our words carefully. I think those two things will, will help. Uh, listening to yourself, finding the positives first, and then approaching the critical parts with a, kind of a, of a you know, with choosing our words carefully. Then the other thing is just the more you do this, the more you'll get used to it. You know, at first it's a little bit tough. And then after a while, you just get, you, you don't even think about it. You just like go directly to the areas that you want to fix. You're not judging yourself. You're just used to hearing yourself and that becomes easier. Um, so kind of, you just know that you can get past that point. Good. There's a um, question What from Caroline East. What are some of the best ways to adjust reads to gain optimal performance and avoid having to throw them away? Well, I, I've got some thoughts. Um, and I'll go back, go back a step. And that is, um, if you're using commercial reads to make sure that the strength read that you're playing is not too hard. And I say not too hard because that, in my opinion, I mean, I, I've worked at mouth, you know, selling my mouthpieces at convent conferences, and I see hundreds of people come through. And I think that if there's a criticism that I typically hear is that people are typically working too hard. Now, granted, the instrument, the clarinet is not an easy instrument. It requires some competence from us. We must play with a high sense of, of our approach with embouchure and all of these things. But, but once we've got all of that buttoned down, let's not make it harder by playing a read that is a fight. So the first thing is to make sure that your read vibrates. And so if it's not, then there are a variety of ways we can, we can work on the read to get it to vibrate. And I've been doing a lot of videos on my Facebook page. I would like to invite you to have a look at those basic um, tools that I use and approaches that I use. I mean, you could use a, a, some scissors and some sandpaper. It's nothing expensive to get the reed to vibrate. The next thing is to know what part of the reed to, to work on to make it vibrate the best for you, for your concept of sound. And for me, to have that real vital E quality of sound. I don't want my sound to be oh. I don't want my sound to be tight and thin, I want it to be resonant. And I think of the singer when they get the squeela in the sound. It is so resonant, the rafters, everything in the room is, is uh, sympathetically resonating with them. So instead of oh or me can hear the E and O simultaneously. I call that double resonance. 
So how do we get the double resonance from the reed? Long vibrations. That's another phrase that Mr. Marcellus coined in lesson for me. He heard me play, I just grabbed my reed and his eyes went off to the side and he said, ooh, that reed is a lollipop. For we were Marcellus students, we might remember that phrase, the reed is a lollipop. That's a good thing. So, uh, and then he mentioned, it sounds like it has long vibrations, meaning the entire blade is vibrating. When you put, breathe into it, you want the entire reed to vibrate. I didn't say blow into it. I said something less forceful. The, the, the air must come in to our sense of humanity. Look at me. I am not a big, strong, hulking person. It would be incongruent for me to be able to play the same setup that somebody twice my size would play. It's an individual thing, that this read search. So for me, my goal is, it's well, if I can play a light read that's got all the vital zinging components, that's the core dense uh, stuff from the cane, that's good because it's an easier good sound. If it doesn't have the zinging components, I always have to come up to it. I have to bite the focus in. That's a bad read. That's a read that's going to go in the trash. So what am I talking about? How can you adjust your reads? By searching them carefully and throwing away the bad ones. Ultimately, you'll come up with some, some the good collection. And how do you get those to go? It's a very um, nuanced craft, but we should all start and, and pursue our lifelong clarinetistry side by side with reed work. I'll leave you with this. How do you know you're great at making working on reeds? After you've filled a laundry basket full of rejects, you're a master. <laughs> I'll jump in here, uh, Brad. Um, I, I think, you know, and Brad, you were kind of commenting on this a little bit. I think to to find good find or start playing on good reads, it really is a, a balance between the read, but the mouthpiece and the ligature. Really, it's just that that connection between. Um, are you playing on a mouthpiece that's really serving your purpose, that's allowing you to play well, uh, and then in conjunction with with the ligature? So, you know, as we're talking about reads, it's not always just about reads. You know, if you if you notice that professional players, you'll you'll hear them complaining less about reads. Like professional players don't really complain about reads like students do, and part of it is the experience having all these years of knowing what a good read is, uh, but some of it is they're just playing better. You know, they're using their air better. They're not fighting against the instrument, including the mouthpiece read and ligature because, you know, they're, they're relaxed with their throat and their, so that's a part of it. The, the better you become as a clarinet player, the, the better that you, um, uh, the better that you're using all the good things that go into clarinet playing well, the less problems you'll have with your reads. And so that's one. I, I, I wanted to mention this earlier too. The great thing about only playing on good reads or throwing out bad reads is that you get really, you get good at knowing what a good read is. Like you start to do, like you start to know this is a good read very specifically because of this part, because of this, I like this quality. I, I like this response. Um, and you really only get that when you play on consistently pretty good reads. You start to determine what a good read is and, and then more specifically what parts of the read you like. Um, I often tell my students, you know, you, especially with commercial reads, you'll, you can't make an okay read great, but you can make a really great read bad. You know, it's kind of like a haircut, right? It's, um, uh, you, you, once you make the wrong cut or the wrong move, then it's going to take a long time. It's like, you know, you're not going to look great that day. So, you know, the question I think was, what are some of the best ways to adjust reads to gain optimal performance? Just know that when you're starting on reads, you want to find pretty good reads from the beginning. And I, and I do think that there's a, you know, I have a break in process for my reads and, you know, sort of quick, quick notes is that you know the beginning life of a read you don't want to overplay it you don't want to waterlog the read by spending too much time with kind of the moisture in your mouth soaking the fibers of the read um, and overplaying them that's a quick way to uh, get the reads not to, to play well afterwards but just kind of slowly and gradually but through rotation uh, breaking them in you know I was just working with my students on reads this week in our studio class and I mentioned I think if you pull 50 players, 
you'll find 49 or 48 different processes for how they break in reads. And that in itself tells you that there is no one way. Honestly, if there was one way to break in reads to make them great, that person would be, even in the clarinet world, a millionaire. Truly, truly they would. Uh, it, so it just goes to show that breaking in reads and this process of figuring out reads is very personal. You know, it, it's part of your journey as a, as a musician and a developing uh, human. Um, so part of, I think, what we're all trying to say today is to start today, to start um, thinking about ways to become better at reads or become better at, you know, developing as a clarinetist through recordings and that, that, those type of things. I'll just jump in very quickly that I, I do think reads and mouthpieces and gear is so personal and so individual. And that's why I'd never give one recommendation for everybody, but I think it is worth having a good mouthpiece that really suits you and having good reads. Um, myself, I actually switched to synthetic reads a couple of years ago, which I thought I would never ever do. And it only worked for me when I found the right combination of mouthpiece read ligature that allowed me to make the sound that I wanted to. Um, it, but even then, synthetic read to synthetic read, there are some that are better than others. So everything Brad said about how you check your best reads and know what the best ones are still applies, even if they're more consistent than cane reads. But it's there's so much variety from person to person, but I think you should have a good read, you should have a good ligature, you should have a good mouthpiece, and sometimes we need to figure out what that is for each of us. Yeah, and I think that goes back, speaks to, you know, we're all different body shapes, sizes, lungs, natural. Some people are just louder wind and other people are softer wind. I, ideally, you know, we need to find the thing that is most appropriate for the instrument. I mean, this isn't the tuba, it's not the flute, it's the clarinet. And um, so the, the big blows and the, and the soft ones, we need to, to, to cultivate the best for the instrument. But you're right, I agree with you entirely, Michelle. I mean, we have to treat each, each one individually. I will say my own studio, my own teaching approach and being a mouthpiece maker, uh, I'll say it uh, with humility, I think of myself as a mouthpiece expert um, it's a very personal thing to me. And so I, it, all of my students don't need to play a Bain mouthpiece, but they all need to play the same type of mouthpiece. And by that, I mean, um, I have a concept of sound, a concept of playing. And so I don't go and give them a whole stack of mouthpieces to try, pick the one that feels right. Same thing with um, uh, when kids are in the fourth grade or fifth grade or whatever, they go to the assembly and they try all the different instruments, flute, trombone, trumpet, clarinet, saxophone, and whatever, whichever one sounds good, the band director, of the, you know, the future band director says, oh, okay, you'll be a flute player. I think that's ridiculous because um, they're just, you know, the kid is getting lucky. There's no talent assessment or evaluation of any kind other than the kid is just create, create a lucky moment that they got a sound on that instrument. Or maybe that reed was particularly good on clarinet and particularly bad on oboe. So the same thing with a student. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to pick their gear. It is the teacher's responsibility to pick it for them. And that student is taking lessons from me. Presumably, they're trusting my opinion. And so I will assert my opinion at that stage. What stage? From beginning through college. When you're in advanced college, you're getting highly influenced by me, but I'll step back. When you're a pro, if you're taking a lesson with me, you're there to hear what I have to say. And, you know, off you go and you can take it or leave it, of course. But, I mean, I think it's, it is something that is extremely important that you get um, you select your equipment based on the concept congruence or incongruence with yours and the teacher. You're seeking out a teacher because you like that person's concept. And then you say, okay, what do I play? Teach me, and then you get it, and then you say, teach me how to get the best out of it. 
That's awesome. I just wanted to, um, these are all such great tips. This is such a fun, informative session. I wanted to share something that Wesley just wrote on the Zoom chat for our Facebook Live people. He wrote, consume a lot of read break-in and or adjustment materials, videos, articles. Go in knowing that you may not find the answer, but that you're going to learn a little more. Even if the concepts do not sink in right away, you may remember it and make those connections at a later date. I, I just want to encourage all of you to, you know, go on YouTube or just Google um, clarinet read adjustment. Now, and 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 f and start make building your own library or go on the ICA web website in 45 minutes we're going to have another zoom session and Jessica's going to uh help us navigate through that site but you'd be amazed how you can search through the ICA journals about read making tips and adjustments or about anything that we've talked about today and i think just building your own personal library and like wesley said just you know soak in all you can and some things little things will 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 speak to you and will work for you and i just think that's what we all should be doing for our students and if you're a student do it for yourself right. too that's a skill that you have to practice at. It's not, uh, it's an art working with reads. And so students need to not be afraid to make mistakes. I tell my students, don't start working on your favorite reads. <laughs> Work on your reads that are your least favorite and see if you can make them better, you know, and keep experimenting to find out what works and what doesn't work. But just don't be afraid to try something. And you can learn something from everybody about how to adjust reads. Everybody's got their secrets and their tips. As we've heard today, so many great ideas. If we yeah. all made a point to say, I'm going to go online and I'm going to learn something today. Just every day, 365 days in the year, I've learned 365 things. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, I'll exactly. just add about the reads too, is, is not to be afraid to try different reads. Um, and, and going to the, say, the Clarinet Fest conferences or, you know, there's various Clarinet days around where you'll have different read um, companies come in. It's a great opportunity to experiment. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, hands up of, of the five of us here who are, who's playing on the same read brand and strength that you've played in the last 15 years. Like we're all, we all change. We all experiment. It, it, it changes as we change as players. So think about the reads brands that you're playing as what you're doing now that might get you to the next read. Sometimes I think about that too. And, you know, working with a student, it's like this mouthpiece may just get you to the next mouthpiece where, you know, we would all be so lucky if we are on a we are on some piece of equipment, whether it's reeds or mouthpiece, but that with the idea of this will get us to the next place where I will, I, I want to outgrow my piece of equipment. Like I want to get to the point where like I'm playing so well that this mouthpiece that I'm now using is no longer serving my purposes, either with the concept of sound or just kind of how I physically put air into the instrument. So the same thing with reeds, I think, you know, we're looking for, I think, two things with, with reeds. It's, and I spoke about this in my first tip. We're looking for the sound, but also we should be looking, we should be thinking about the feeling. So, you know, it's an interesting question to consider. If you had a new rebrand and you were trying it and strength and everything and you it just made clarinet playing feel so much easier you could connect notes i mean you could leap up and down and it just felt easier but you didn't love the sound you're like i don't really like the sound as much as this read so what would you do would you go with the read that sounded great but you really have to, you were struggling to make the clarinet work or do you go with the read that makes the clarinet playing feel great and easy and fun but maybe the sound isn't as good as you like i mean that's something for all of us i think just to think and consider and i i think most of us might say it's about the sound right because it's appealing it's appealing to us and it's appealing to others but sometimes you know, allow yourself that period of time to say, maybe this is the read that I need to play now and for the next six months or the next year so that I become a better clarinet player. And sometimes equipment can help us to release bad habits. 
Maybe that reed allows us to play with less tension in our throat because we're feeling less back pressure. And then after six months to a year, we can go to a different reed or another piece of equipment that sounds better, that sounds pleasing. And at that point, we no longer have those issues we had. So that reed kind of carried us. And we took the train to the next, to the next uh, uh, station. And maybe it wasn't a pleasant trip, but always, always in the end, we're happy we're at the next station. You know, so we can think about reeds a little bit and equipment that way. Can I say yeah, something? I think oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah. Just very quickly. Um, you know, the, the little old lady in, in the audience, Wesley, if you were to play, oh, let me try this reed and try that reed, this mouthpiece. And she's going to say, well, they both sound like a clarinet. Yes. I knew you'd go there. Exactly. Right. <laughs> but ultimately, what we need to do is play the one that, that feels good, because it, presumably if it feels good, our artistry is more free to blossom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I think we're, we're all, especially the more mature that we get as players, we are very confident in the sound we produce. You know, I want to sound like me. I just want to sound like me on the best possible equipment that helps me achieve that with the greatest ease and less work. I had one of my teachers, Frank Walski, I don't think you're listening, but love you. Um, uh, uh, and he would be playing on a particular mouthpiece. And I mean, Frank could play on any of our mouthpieces and sound like him. Unbelievable. I wish I could do that. I can't do that. But he would constantly just say, oh, I have to work really hard. And he would then try different mouthpieces. And But he would always gravitate to that one mouthpiece that he claimed he had to work a little bit harder at but quite frankly it helped him achieve the sound he wanted so i think we're all and i think we have to help like brad said help our younger students find that equipment you know to achieve their sound but you're not going to be able to sound like i'm not if i played on brad's equipment i couldn't sound like brad as much as i would want to because <laughs> i have my own you know, I have my own structure inside my oral, ca oral cavity. There's only so much, you know, that we can do. So just strive to find your sound, your tonal concept, and try lots of stuff until you can find equipment that helps you play with ease and comfort so you love playing music. We're so lucky because there's so much great equipment out there, whether it be reeds, mouthpieces, instruments, barrels, bells, all things that you can try. Try them all. Find what works for you. There's no one right thing, right? It's what works best for you. And I think sometimes we get so stuck that we must play this or we must play this. Be open, you know? And young students, now is when you should be trying things, and especially like when you get to well, hopefully go to Clarinet Fest again. <laughs> Um, next summer and be where you have all of these great people. Brad will be there. All these great people will be there with their equipment for you to go and try and experiment. That's the perfect place for you to do it. It's hard to hear, so find a quiet place, but it's <laughs> there for you. You don't have to just look at it online. You can actually try it. And that's the best thing. Or go to somebody's clarinet day. Go to the Lift Clarinet Academy. Go to these different experiences that you can have and where you can be around great players and teachers and try equipment while they're there and get some feedback. You know? Fruits. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. He's made two appearances now. Um, so, uh, but for sure, you know, as we're going to wrap up here, for sure, uh, um, please seek out Brad's Facebook videos. Bradford Bain, that is his Facebook. I'm, he, he told me recently, yeah, have your, have your students friend me. I'll accept them just so they can watch his videos. Um, and go to the Clarinet Mentors website and look at the wonderful videos that Michelle has created. And go to uh, Wesley's Tip Tuesdays, you know, friend Wesley and get those into your Facebook feed on a weekly basis. And then, you know, f we have so many... Sometimes I, this is horrible. I tell my students, well, back in my day, I had to go to the library, you know, <laughs> do the, you know, um, and, and that's horrible of me, this old lady um, saying that. But, you know, you have all of these resources. We have all of these resources available to us yeah. without even leaving our rooms. So take advantage of all those wonderful opportunities. It's actually been a gift of the pandemic that, that we have so many more people coming out and sharing their knowledge with us that we can get so easily. Yes. Yes. I just thought of another tip. Can I very briefly say, look at Diane and Denise. They are buddies and they are better for their experience, their friendship. 
we should all have a clarinet buddy, somebody you can bounce ideas off of and get honest and nurturing and supportive um, help. Uh, I have a clarinet buddy, and I'm very fortunate for it. And um, I cannot understate the, the value of that. It's a gift, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah, we send each other texts all the time with videos. <laughs> what do you think of this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to our wonderful panelists, we thank you so much for your knowledge and expertise and your time. Um, this has been just so wonderful. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our attendees. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope that you'll join us in a half hour for the ICA website um, um, session. And then we have three more sessions tomorrow. So please join us for any or all of them. And we all, we just wish you happy clarinet playing. Yes, and stay safe. And my teacher heart is so excited. I'm ready to go try some new things and talk to my students in different ways. And thank you all for sharing this. We've, we've felt very fortunate that you've joined us for our first clarinet extravaganza. So yes. thanks. So thanks, Denise and Diane. You're organizing a wonderful event here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. We're going to do it again in the spring. So First weekend of March. Mark your calendars. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.